Shalom and welcome to Tov, the Jewish news channel. My name is Ruchi Avital, and we have with us today Rabbi Jonathan Feldman, who has joined us to talk about uh, Jewish morality or ethics in war. What do our sources, our rabbinic and Torah sources, have to tell us about how we're allowed to fight the war? We know that a lot of people around the world, a lot of institutions have a lot to tell us about how we should and mostly how we should not be fighting this war. But what do our own sources tell us about that? What is moral? What is ethical? In the subject of the hostages, in the subject of civilians on the other side, enemy civilians. Okay. Rabbi? Rufi. Nice to be here and at Tov Network. So. Um, I mean, the first thing to say, which is absurd that when it has to be stated, but the Torah, the Talmud says, if someone's coming to kill you, you get up and you kill them first. Basic self-defense. And it has to be stated because, as we know, uh, Israel's right to self-defense, proportionality, all of this uh, is on the, peddled around in the media but we assert our right to defend ourselves against enemies who attack us. That's the most basic fundamental right. That's where it all starts. Now from there, obviously Judaism places human life in the highest value and uh, we're all created in the image of God and human life has infinitesimal value. You can't barter one life against a hundred even. Uh, however, with that said, so According to that, if one could incapacitate a person coming to kill you without having to kill them, shoot them in the legs, you would do so. But if you have any doubt that that might be less effective, then you don't have then to. Then there's no doubt. If there's then, any doubt, there's no doubt. If any, <laughs> if any doubt, then there's no doubt, and you do everything you have to, to do to defend yourself, and you're not obligated to hold back in any way. So. so we know that there are laws in the Torah about besieging a city, right? You're supposed to warn them ahead of time, and if somebody wants to escape, you're supposed to allow them to escape. Am I right about that? This is correct. However, Maimonides says explicitly, the conditions upon which you will give them a chance to escape are that they accept to be demilitarized, to be politically subjugated, mm. And so it's not like you're saying, okay, we'll let our enemies escape with their arms and that, so that they can go recruit and attack us. Uh, they become, in, in the ancient world, they became what tantamount to uh, subjugated. Uh, today the equivalent would be complete demilitarization and complete political control over them because they're enemies who have attacked you. And today we know they say they'll do it again if they can. So that caveat is very important. Okay, so I have to ask you about the subject of humanitarian aid. A lot of pressure has been placed on Israel, and Israel basically has given in to a large part of that pressure, to allow the entry of humanitarian aid from Israel, uh, which includes flour, food, and, but also fuel which we know can be used against us. So do we have, according to Jewish ethics and morality, do we have an obligation to provide sustenance to the enemy or to provide fuel to the enemy? So there are competing values. There's the Torah values. There's what today is considered to be humanitarian or international law. Look, what's clear is that if that aid is going to the enemy fighters, then there'll be no obligation. Uh, if you can guarantee that it's going to civilians, not obligated, but I believe the Torah outlook to do would be to provide the civilians with the aid. Uh, so it really now becomes a political question. Where is that aid going? What's happening to it? Why can't it be secured to go to civilians? And we, if we know it's going to our enemy fighters, then there'll be no obligation to provide it. Okay, so that's, that's really a difficult question that Israel is dealing with. It is. As, now. I, as I understand it, you know, uh, um, holding over Israel's head the threat of a major humanitarian crisis could force Israel to end the war before it actually wants to. So it might possibly be in Israel's interest to a certain extent to avert a humanitarian crisis among civilians. 
so in terms of civilian, civilian casualties, so now we have to go into this area. And what's so very interesting is that we'll probably talk about captives. Captives, there's an enormous amount of literature about this because unfortunately throughout the ages, pirates kidnap people mm -hmm. uh, and it happened a lot. Civilian casualties, because as a Jewish people we have not had an army, we have not been empowered politically for 2,000 years, there's much less sources about it. However, uh, there are some media sources, notably the Maral, who tells us that uh, civilian casualties are to be minimized and it's a very unfortunate part of war that civilians do die in the fighting. Uh, but if one needs to fight one's war, remember, the Torah would be that you allow people to escape if they will demilitarize. And then, and it, by the way, it's very close to what the Geneva Convention is. You tell the civilians to get out, to move away. And by the way, we have to remember that the fact that the fighters are mixed with civilians is already against international law. And that the fighters are wearing civilian clothes. Clothing. against international law. Nevertheless, you give the civilians a chance to escape. And after that, you conduct your war. It's very unfortunate, but uh, there are going to be civilian casualties, and that, it, Marel says, this is part of war. Life is lost. And by the way, as I said, the, the, we have to remember that the Geneva Convention states that as well. And so it's interesting how the two are very much parallel. And uh, we have done what we can. They actually intersect. Yeah. They're yeah. not. They meet, yeah, yeah. <laughs> not parallel. So, um, so those are the expectations, which uh, so I think, as we know, Israel is trying to meet. You know, there might be uh, canard courts set up to deny otherwise, but even there was recognized that you know, Israel goes out of its way to protect civilians. But once again, if it would be the death of your soldier or an unfortunate casualty of civilians, it's pretty clear that you have to conduct the war the best way you can to win and to protect your soldiers. Absolutely. Uh, in fact, as far as I understand, Israel's ratio of casualties of, say, terrorists to civilians is one of the lowest or the lowest in the world. But that, uh, I have to ask you about the question of the hostages. Um, one can't escape, of course, anywhere in Israel, but especially in Tel Aviv, signs everywhere saying, bring them home now. Bring them home now. And some people, uh, famously in the Knesset, a couple weeks ago, uh, uh, a well-known Knesset member said, we have to do whatever we can, give everything for everything. Release 6,000 Hamas prisoners. And we know that Yechia Sinwar himself was released in a prisoner exchange of 1,027 terrorists for one Israeli soldier, Gilad Shalit. So what, what do our ethics tell us to do in such a situation? So the first thing to note is that in tzedakah, in charity money, in communal funds, the highest priority is to release captives, is to redeem captives, to uh, ransom hostages to freedom. Which was a That's fact of life in medieval Jewish life, right? People would be, mm -hmm. like in South America today, perhaps, criminals would kidnap yeah. people for ransom. Right, so there was a whole, in fact, the word, bar uh, you know, the Barbary Coast, uh, bar the word Barbary is from the Barbary Coast where they kidnapped, uh, pirates would kidnap people going, traveling across the Mediterranean and ransom them. So the, the Mishnah says that you don't, ransom a person more than for their value. You don't overpay, so to speak. Now, What's what does that mean? What's the value of what is the value? life? So this is very interesting if you think about it. So let's say a pirate is off the coast of Italy, right? And they intercept a Spanish ship. Now, uh, generally, the Italians wouldn't care about the Spanish. They're not going to do anything. So the pirate would go and sell them on the slave market. Mm. But they knew that Jewish communities in Italy will redeem Jews from Spain. Right? We're all one people, we're all brothers and sisters, and we're all responsible for each other. The halacha doesn't distinguish any Jew. Uh, you have an obligation to try and ransom them. So if the pirate was between selling them on the slave market or ransoming to the Jewish community, okay, I'll ransom to the Jewish community. So that was the criterion of what would they get otherwise for this person. Uh, the Talmud explains 
why, what is the Mishnah's rationale for saying not, don't ransom it for too much? The first reason given is because it'll, uh, it'll uh, make the community destitute if all their funds are being, ran, uh, being paid out. And often, especially here in Israel under the Ottomans, the corrupt governors would grab important Jews and then uh, demand exorbitant amounts of money uh, to ransom them, and it would wipe out the financial stability of the Jewish community. Well, so the Maharam of Rotenberg, if I'm not mistaken, was he famously languished mm -hmm. in prison for many, many years because he refused to have himself ransomed above his for worth, six years. As it six were. years, yeah. this great communal leader refused, and um, and he died. In, he wound up dying in prison tragically, but he wanted to show a precedent. Now the second reason. Well, I think he probably wanted to put an end to this cottage industry of. Uh, ah, so that's the yeah. second reason that the Talmud gives. The second reason. Now the first reason. Interestingly, now we say Jewish life is more valuable than anything. So why wouldn't you give all your money? So back then, if the community would give all their money, remember child mortality was high, uh, basic sustenance wasn't found. So if the community would be wiped out, they wouldn't have money to keep themselves alive. So, but the second reason given... To say nothing of the next one. Oh, so that's the second reason given in the Talmud, yeah. which is if you go ransoming for exorbitant sums, it will just incentivize the, the kidnappers to grab more people. And uh, we can't help think that if they felt they got a thousand for uh, Gilad Shalit, um, that became part of their strategy, which it was even before that. Now, uh, the... This, though, is not talking about where you know the person will be killed. This is generally the, the pirates. It was their incentive to keep the captured people alive. Or sell them into slavery. Or to sell, so they could have them as a commodity to sell. If the person's going to be killed, oh. then maybe now there might be a difference. Because it's what we call a suffolk and a vadai. If it's a vadai that this person is going to be killed, and you ransom them, and the money going is going, might, it might incentivize them in the future to, to kidnap more people, but you don't know. Or it might give them funds to attack you again, but that hasn't happened. So you could say, do it certain. Save the person who's alive against a whole lot of other contingencies. Better the devil you know than the devil you don't know. However, however, uh, there was a infamous story in the 1970s. A jetliner on the way to Athens was kidnapped, brought to Jordan. There was a very prominent rabbi, Rabbi Yitzhak Hutner, who was on the plane. Mm -hmm. And there was a big debate about do we ransom him or not. And they demanded an enormous amount of money when they realized who he was. One of his backers in Brooklyn were ready to raise at the time three million dollars, which was an enormous sum of money. And there was a debate amongst the rabbis from his community in the United States. What do we do? And notably, Rabbi Yaakov Kamenetsky said that we're in a state of war. We're in a state of war against the Palestinians. It started in 1948. It has never ceased. And in a state of war, you do not do things which will strengthen your yeah. enemy's ability to continue to attack you. So he was against ransoming because he knew the funds would be used so that, to attack more Jews. So that's the situation we're in now. We're not talking about Barbary pirates uh, trying right. to uh, get money any way they can um, in, in uh, inhumane and immoral ways. We're talking about an enemy that will use whatever we give them against us in the next round. And unfortunately, releasing more terrorists who will make more attacks and continue in the war. Now, there were rabbis who disagreed with Rabbi Kamenetsky. Mm. And so uh, no this there. is heart-wrenching, obviously. And if it was my relative, I would do everything to try and free them no matter what the stakes. Mm -hmm. uh, and our political leaders have a decision that we want, no one would want to be in their no position to have to make such decisions. Where do, do, do you draw that line where it's too much? Right. This is the question. And um, where do you draw that line between what you know that this person will probably die and what you don't know, what will be in the future, we don't even, maybe we, we have can never, avert it? We haven't been given any access to them at all. We don't know how many of them are alive. So, well, that's another issue as well. So what I'm saying is that there is 
a difference of opinion. There is range to work within, and um, and really it depends upon a lot of these these factors, which uh, we probably are not even aware of all the factors. I'm sure that, we're not that the yeah. political and military leadership has to keep into account. And we do know they may not know everything either. What we do know is it's heart wrenching. What we do know that in Jewish values, it's the primary value to free our captives. However, as we know now, there's competing values of eliminating our enemies, long-term safety of our country, and of more people. So those are the issues. That's the Torah approach. The Torah does have this awareness of not over, uh, strengthening your enemies by doing this. And that's, you know, those are the factors to, to, put, to put on the, on the scales. Well, Gilda Cohen said many years ago that if her son were kidnapped for ransom in a situation like this, uh, that she would scream and yell and demand that the government do everything in its power to release him. But if she were in the government, which she was, but if she were in the government, she, would, she wouldn't expect the government to give in to the demands of the parents, that they're the ones who have to make the decision based on, as you said, factors that, that may not be in the public awareness at all. Um, and weighing things that we, na we outside may not be aware of. It's a very, very, very terrible dilemma to be in for all of us, and especially for those who actually have to make the decision. Thank you very much, Rabbi Feldman, and thank you to our listeners. Uh, don't forget to like us on all our media channels. Shalom.